Hi everyone and welcome to today's lesson which is on three different techniques that are all connected as one main concept. So first we'll go over the plasmid mini prep. Then we'll go over 260 to 80 readings to determine concentration of DNA as well as contamination. And lastly, we'll go over gel electrophoresis, which you see in the meme on this slide. Now, one of the things I emphasize to students when I mentor them or when I teach them in a lab is the idea that whenever you do experiments, you have to think about why did I do them? You know, what's the purpose? What comes next? Where does it all fit into the big picture of what I want to get done? So when I say that we're going to do a plasmid mini prep or we're going to focus on mini prep today, you kind of have to place it into the big picture. So last time we did transformation <clears throat> and remind yourself, well, what was the purpose of transformation? The purpose of transformation was to get foreign new DNA in the form of a plasmid into bacterial cells, which would then replicate that plasmid for us and produce new proteins. Now, if the purpose of transformation was to get that plasmid DNA, that extra DNA into the bacteria to use them as a factory to make many copies of that plasmid DNA, well then why might we want to do mini prep now? Well, we want to be able to get those copies of DNA out of the bacteria, okay? So you use transformation to get new DNA into the bacteria so the bacteria made many copies of it now you want to use mini prep technique in order to isolate and purify that plasmid out of the bacteria. Now, when we talked about the plasmid previously, you have to ask yourself, well, what aspect of the plasmid that we discussed last time might help us do this, might help us isolate, meaning get that plasmid out of the bacteria and purify it, well, the fact that the plasmid is small, remember we said that the plasmid should be fairly small DNA, this will help us selectively precipitate just the small plasmid separate from all of the large chromosomal bacterial DNA as well as the proteins. So you'll be able to get just the plasmid alone by itself like you want to. Now, just like when we talked about the mini prep, whenever you do an experiment, I want you to be comfortable with the various steps that are performed and really understand why you're doing each of those steps. So whenever you hear a reagent or a certain step, you should be able to quickly say, oh, the purpose of that is blah, blah, blah. Okay, now just like with the transformation with mini preps, each time you see a protocol, it might be slightly different. You know, the reagents might have slightly different names. A lot of times you'll use kits and the kit will have, you know, for instance, buffer A, B, C or buffer P1, P2, P3. But what those actually are inside of those bottles that you use in the kit will match up with the general key steps that we talk about today. Now, when you're going to do a mini prep, the first thing that you have to do is grab a hold of your transformation plate and make sure that it's one that is one of the selective plates. So, For instance, in our P-Blue experiment, you would grab the AMP XGAL plate that had the nice blue colonies. You would then clamshell open. So this was the clamshell aseptic technique we talked about last time. Remember to circle star, highlight this picture and write clamshell method. Okay, you never fully open a plate. And what you would do is you would take an inoculation loop, which is a little tough to see in this picture. You could see the handle, but there's a little metal loop that they're using to scoop up one of those blue colonies and then you would inoculate it here into your liquid nutrient rich LB media. Okay, and you would grow a culture of those transformed cells. So that's the first step of any mini prep. You would take your transformation colonies and grow them in liquid culture. 
Now you notice this tube here, we can tell that it has bacteria in it because the clear or yellowish clear liquid that was transparent before now has what we call high turbidity. Okay, so turbidity is this word here. That's a fancy way of saying the liquid became cloudy. Okay, you can no longer see through it. Okay, and a lot of times you'll see a little film on top called a pellicle and some sediment on the bottom. Okay, but ultimately these three things, pellicle, turbidity, sediment, it all shows you that you have grown the bacteria successfully. If your bacteria did not grow when you placed it incubating overnight, then the culture will still be clear. And that would tell you that those bacterial cells were not very viable or they just need a little more time to grow. Okay, But ultimately, the first step is to grow those transformation cells get the nice cloudy media and then you want to collect those cells so when I say collect transformed cells I mean this cloudy media high turbidity you want to get only the bacteria out of it now that you made a whole bunch of copies of that transformed bacteria and the way that you would do that is you centrifuge it okay you Okay, let me grab the pen so that I can write this for you. You centrifuge, okay? Centrifuge is a fancy way of saying that you take that liquid culture and you spin it down in a centrifuge and that very fast centripetal force, that circular spinning, will pull all of those bacterial cells down to the bottom of the tube into a pellet. And then what you have left on top will be the liquid, which later we'll call supernatant. You'll see how to spell that later. So you'll have the liquid on top. That's just the media that you grew those cells in. Okay, so you grow the transformed cell from that single colony. You now collect all of the replicated bacteria from that liquid that you, you cultured it in. And then last in these first three steps, you want to resuspend an RNase solution. And when you see RNase, that tells you that that's a solution that chops up RNA in that sample. Okay, now why will you want to do that? Well, because once the cells get lysed in the next steps that we're gonna talk about, the RNA solution will chop up any RNA without hurting the DNA. Okay, so you want RNA solution to chop up the RNA without hurting the DNA because your ultimate goal in the mini prep is just to get the plasma DNA by itself nice and clean. You don't want RNA, you don't want protein or any cell debris. Then you would continue on with the main steps of a mini prep. Next, you would add lysis solution. And lysis solution usually contains what we call SDS, SDS, which is a detergent. And then it also tends to contain NaOH. Okay. Now, SDS is a detergent that, so talking about this one, SDS is a detergent in the lysis buffer that will disrupt the cell membranes of the bacteria, okay? So it disrupts the cell membranes of the bacteria so that the chromosomal and the plasma DNA will be released. Then the high pH of the NaOH helps denature any of the large macromolecules, the big, big macromolecules, okay? So for instance, the big chromosomal DNA, but it won't bother the nice little plasmid, okay? Then you would add a protease solution. And that's very important, this protease solution, because what that does is it chops up proteins, right? It inactivates enzymes that are proteins 
and this includes nucleases. Okay, so if you forgot how to spell that, nucleases. Okay, now that protease will inactivate the nucleases, okay, break them apart or denature them. And so with that protease solution that will help, you know, break down or chop up those enzymes, those are enzymes, the nucleases, that might hurt the isolated plasmid DNA once it's freed by the lysis solution. So you want the protease to chop up or get rid of the nucleases so that the nucleases do not break your plasmid DNA, do not destroy your plasmid, okay? Because again, your ultimate goal, get just the plasmid by itself safe and purified. Then what you want to do is add a neutralization solution, which is usually this word here, potassium acetate. So potassium acetate or acetic acid, sometimes you see it written as potassium acetic acid. What that does is it neutralizes the solution and that when you see acetate or acetic acid, that's a low pH. Why is that neutralizing? Well, because what did we do a few steps before? We had the lysis buffer, which was a high pH, okay? It was very basic, like some people I know. And so that high pH of NaOH, you now want to neutralize with the low pH. This is a very significant step here, okay, that neutralization solution, because with the lysis solution, with the high pH, we said that that was denaturing macromolecules, in, including that big chromosomal bacterial DNA. The neutralization solution now, doing the opposite, will renature you know, refold the macromolecules, but it doesn't do this correctly, okay? Because think about it, chromosomal DNA, that's huge. Proteins, they can be kind of big compared to your little old plasmid. So those big macromolecules, when they've been unfolded, it's very tough to put them back together properly because they're so large, have so many parts to them. Whereas the plasmid was never denatured fully, okay? Because it's so small and super coiled, that didn't really get denatured. So when you have the neutralization solution, renaturing things, it's renaturing poorly or incorrectly the big chromosomal DNA and proteins into a clump an aggregated clump, okay? This means that at the end of this, the supernatant, which is the liquid in the tube, okay? So this right here, this clear liquid here, that's the supernatant, okay? That supernatant, I'll just put an S for supernatant. That supernatant will be where your nice little plasmid DNA is. Okay, because it never got denatured, it never got renatured into the clump, it's nice and small, stays by itself. That will have the plasmid up here. Sorry, the pen is misbehaving because I'm running out of screen. You know what? I'll write it on this side. So the supernatant up top, that will have your plasmid. And the pellet. See this pellet down here, that beige clump? That will be the renatured clump of a mess of the cellular debris. Okay, so you can call that the poorly renatured macromolecules. in the pellet, okay? And so the poorly renatured macromolecules, that can be 
the chromosomal DNA, as well as any of the proteins and cellular debris. Now, the reason why in this picture you have it so nicely separated, the nice clear liquid with the plasmid and the poorly renatured cellular debris, okay, you can call it cell debris. The reason that's nice and separated is because the tubes, once you add the lysis solution, the protease, the neutralization, they were then spun down in a centrifuge. Okay, so this structure here is the centrifuge. It spins around really fast to then pellet the cellular debris, the more dense, bigger uh, particles, whereas the nice small plasmid stays up top. Now notice whenever you use a centrifuge, you see you have to balance it, meaning you put both of your tubes with equal volume across from each other. You would never have a tube, let's say here and here, with nothing else. They have to be across from each other and have equal volume. Otherwise, the machine flips out. It goes crazy and you break it, okay? So make sure you're very comfortable with each of these steps in terms of the, the first portion of a mini prep where you are trying to ultimately isolate the plasmid, which we did by the end of these steps here. You have the supernatant, you have your plasmid. That then leads us to the next steps, the final part of a mini prep. So now that you have the plasmid by itself in that liquid portion in the supernatant, you have to be very careful and make sure that you pipette that, so let me highlight this, you pipette that liquid, the supernatant containing the plasmid into what we have here, a nice column filter. Notice that little weight at the bottom, that's because there's a filter in there specific to grabbing a hold of plasmid DNA. Now, please, whenever you do a mini prep, be careful at this step. Make sure that you are collecting the supernatant, the liquid, and discarding the pellet. The pellet is all the cellular debris and junk. I've had many students who throw out the liquid thinking that's you know, just it's clear, it's liquid, that can't contain anything important. And then they use the pellet in the next steps. You never want to do that. The pellet is the junk, the cellular debris, the liquid is what you want. Now that you have that plasmid nice in the liquid, your final goal is to purify it, wash it, clean it nicely. So like I said, what you do, you take that liquid, you pipette it into this nice column, okay, and you put that column you have it in another tube, which you can call the collecting tube, okay? So when I say how do you bind the plasma DNA, you bind the DNA by pipetting it or putting it, if you can't spell pipetting, you put it into a membrane filter. You put it into a column filter, which is this guy here, and that filter is specific to the size of plasmids. It grabs a hold of plasmids. You then wash that plasmid by pouring wash solution over it, specifically ethanol. You do ethanol washes. And in a lot of protocols, you'll see ethanol written. Let me grab the pen as E-T-O-H. Okay, so when you see ETOH in the protocol, that is for washing your plasmid. The reason you need to wash it is that it will remove any of the remaining cellular debris or chemicals that might kind of still be in that sample from the previous steps, okay? Now you want to then elute the DNA. And what elute the DNA means, so that's this word here, what that means is you want to get the DNA off of the column, off of the filter, okay? You want to collect it. So for elute, start that word and write the definition, which is getting the DNA off of the filter, 
and collecting that DNA, okay? You do that with TE, Tris EDTA, or what we call nuclease free H2O. Okay, that's water that's been specially um, purified where it is known that there are no nucleases, okay? Meaning it cannot chop up your plasmid DNA. If you use regular water, regular water a lot of times has been contaminated with nuclease. With, with those enzymes, because they're all over around you, enzymes that can chop up DNA, which you don't want. You want your plasma to stay nice and happy and complete. Now, when I say TE, what TE means is Tris EDTA. And so the E of TE, that I'll underline the E, stands for EDTA. And what EDTA does is it inactivates nucleases. Okay? So you're, when you elute the plasmid and you collect the plasmid DNA to then store, you either want it in TE, which the EDTA can inactivate nucleases by what's called chelating magnesium. Okay? So I'll write that fancy word and then tell you what it means so you can impress your friends. So chelate, oops, sorry, my pen is acting up, chelating magnesium ions. Okay, so EDTA chelates magnesium ions, which is a fancy way of saying it binds to magnesium. Okay, so it basically hoards magnesium which the nucleases would need as cofactors to help them chop up DNA. Okay, so EDTA or TE, by binding up all the magnesium, it protects the plasmid because that means the nucleases can't function properly because they don't have access to the magnesium because the TE took it off. Okay, so whenever you elute, make sure you emphasize the fact that you want to make sure to protect your plasmid so that it cannot get chopped up by nucleases. You do that either with TE or nuclease-free water. Now, the last point I want to make is the role of salts in this process. Okay, the role of salts is that what we did was in earlier steps, we used solutions that had high salt content, okay? And by using solutions that had high salt content earlier on in the steps, that basically kept the DNA precipitated out of solution, okay? Because salts, what they do is the positive charges, if you picture salt as NaCl, the positive sodiums stick to negative DNA. You saw that in transformation. They attract each other. And so when that happens, they clump together and get pulled out of solution. So in the earlier steps, like the binding step or the washing step, you use solutions or buffers that have high salt so that the DNA is clumped out of the, the liquid, okay, out of solution, and stays stays stuck to the filter here, okay? So in terms of having high salt early on, so let me just write that here, high salt early, then low salt elution. Okay, so this step here, the elute, <clears throat> you'll notice that that step, when we said TE or water, even nuclease-free water, that was low salt. Because what's that going to do if before high salt clumped or aggregated or we say precipitated out the DNA out of solution so it's stuck to the filter, 
then low salt will make it fall off of the filter. Okay, so the role of salts in this process, high salts earlier on, so I'll put it here so you see high salts earlier on, like binding and washing, DNA precipitates. meaning sticks to filter. Then in the elution stage, low salt DNA falls off filter. And falling off is a good thing because it then falls off into the collection tube here. Okay, so then you can throw out that filter on top and you have nice, clean, uh, hopefully pure plasma DNA. Now I say hopefully have nice, pure uh, plasma DNA because you're not sure. At this point, all you see is clear liquid that looks just like water. You can't see your plasmid because it's DNA, right? Can you look at your hand, your, your leg, see, see your DNA? No, it's too small, it's microscopic. So at the end of a pretty mini prep, just collecting the DNA, you don't know if you were successful. To determine whether or not you were successful, you then have to do two things. The first one is in this picture here. So the first thing you do is use, that machine is called a nano, drop and all it takes is one drop of your sample or you use a UV spec okay and I'm sorry my my U and my V look very similar in that picture but that is supposed to be a U and a V here I'll, I'll put the little tail on the U so you can see UV spec and that technique we're going to talk about in a minute will help you uh, measure the concentration and determine the purity of the sample the other thing that you'll do is you will visualize with gel electrophoresis, okay? And this structure here is the gel. This here is the power source. Okay, this is the gel. And what you do is you load your samples into wells, which um, you can't really see in the picture, but we'll see in later slides exactly how that's working. Now, the first thing that we mentioned is the idea of measuring concentration, so the nanospec or UV, okay, so UV spectrophotometer or nano drop. Okay, and the reason we use these types of things is that the aromatic rings, so when you see the, the nitrogen bases of DNA and RNA, meaning A's, T's, G's, C's, or A, U, G, C, when you see these structures, they have those rings in their chemical structure, those can absorb UV light at a very particular wavelength. And that wavelength is 260 nanometers. <clears throat> the proteins, on the other hand, because of their chemical structures and the particular rings that they have, they absorb UV wavelengths at 280 nanometers. Okay, so I want you to associate the number 260 with nucleic acids and the number 280 with proteins, okay? Circle, star, highlight that information. Now, because of that fact, okay, what we do is we use the ratio 260 nanometer over 280. So a reading you'll get, you'll, you'll see it called the 260 over 280. Now, keep in mind, we said 260 represents what? DNA or RNA, the nucleic acids, okay? Whereas 280, that represents protein. This will help you figure out what a 260-280 reading will tell you, okay? 
So for instance, pure DNA has a 262-80 reading or ratio that we call 1.8. If you do a mini prep and then you put the sample in a nano drop or UV spec and you see a 262-80 reading of 1.8 or very close to it, that means you did a very good job. You got pure DNA, you cleaned out all of the other contaminants. If, however, there are still proteins contaminating your sample, what will happen? Well, think about it in basic math. The proteins are the bottom part of this fraction, right? They're the denominator. So when you have the bottom part of a fraction get bigger, for instance, you go from 1 over 2, 1 half, to 1 over 4, 1 quarter, what's happened to the overall number, that overall ratio? It's gotten smaller, right? 1 half is a lot bigger than 1 quarter. So as you increase the bottom number of a fraction, you decrease the total number, right? So if proteins are present in your sample, you are increasing the bottom number of the fraction so the ratio gets smaller. You will see a number lower than 1.8. So for instance, if you do a reading and you see 1.3, okay, 1.3 or 1.2, 1.45, even if you see 1.7, that's slightly less than your pure DNA ultimate goal number of 1.8. So any number for the 260-280 ratio that is less than 1.8 tells you that you have protein contamination. And if you have protein contamination, what might you want to do? Well, make sure to increase the protease step of the mini prep. Okay, because you want to make sure you're chopping up and cleaning up that sample, getting rid of proteins. If RNA is present, instead, RNA is one of the upper numbers, right? The numerators. Okay, so it's the top part of the fraction. When you increase the top part of a fraction, what happens gets bigger, right? So having 2 over 2 instead of 1 over 2 you now have a much bigger total number. Now, pure RNA is 2.0 reading on a 260-280 ratio. Okay, so the 260-280 ratio of pure DNA would be 2.0. And that's because of the single-stranded nature and the types of uh, aromatic rings that are present. Now, I'm not going to ask you the chemistry behind it. That's okay. What I want you to know is that pure DNA is 1.8. Pure RNA is 2.0. So if you have RNA contaminating your sample, then you end up with a ratio higher or greater than 1.8, okay? Higher than... 1.8. So for instance, I can give you any 260-280 ratio and you should be able to analyze it. So for instance, if I tell you the 260-280 ratio that you got is 1.95, what would you tell me that there's RNA contaminating the sample? Okay, because it's higher than 1.8. Now what I want you to do, I'm going to write it so you see this in case you're fast forwarding, you'll know to stop. Remind app, in the Remind app, I want you to tell me if you did a 260-280 ratio reading and you got 1.45 as the ratio, okay, as 260-280 ratio, what would this tell you? Okay, so stop the video, pause the video, head to the Remind app, and tell me how would you analyze, or what would it tell you if your 260, 280 is 1.45, and tell me why. Okay, so, and why. I want to see both, okay?
If you're having any trouble understanding this slide, just simply ask me and remind and I'll go over it again. But be very clear, I could ask you any 260-280 ratio and I could tell you what it means. If I give you 1.8, it means you got pure DNA, you did a great job. If it's a number that's lower than 1.8, even by a little bit, it tells you that there's either a little or a lot of protein contamination, depending on how much lower it is. So for instance, 1.3, you would say that's a lot of protein contamination. 1.7, 1.75, okay, you got a little protein contamination. If it's higher than 1.8, that tells you you have RNA contamination. Okay, make sure you're clear on this slide because I always ask about it. Now, in addition to using the nanodrop or the UV spec in order to get a numerical representation of our DNA after the mini prep, we also always like to do gel electrophoresis. Okay, so whenever we say visualizing the DNA, what you will be doing, and pardon me, I'm just going to grab the pen, what you will be doing is called gel electrophoresis and with that whenever I ask the purpose of gel electrophoresis I want you to say two things the purpose is to visualize DNA and the purpose is to use electricity to separate DNA fragments based on their approximate sizes as they move through this gel matrix. Okay, so if I ask about the purpose of gel electrophoresis, it's to visualize the DNA as well as to use electricity to separate DNA fragments based on size. Now, when you do this, you use what's called an agarose gel, and basically it looks like gelatin or like a jello mold, but it's made up of a network of microscopic little pores for the DNA to kind of snake through, to navigate its way through. Now, whenever you do gel electrophoresis, you use a salt buffer around that gel because like we just said, the purpose of gel electrophoresis is to use electricity to move those DNA fragments. And so the salt buffer, the reason why you're using salt is to conduct the current, okay? So salt conducts the electricity to help with the movement. Now, critical to this movement is the concept of what charged DNA is. DNA, as we know, has a negative charge, and that's going to be critical in the next slides when we go over how exactly the gel electrophoresis is working. So when you do gel electrophoresis, you load your DNA samples, which you can see here, use your pipette to put a DNA sample into each of the rectangular shaped wells that are cut out in the gel. Okay, so when you make that gel, just like with gelatin, you pour the liquid agarose into a mold for, you know, that rectangular mold to form the gel. And then you have this comb that you stick into it while it's still liquid so that the, the, the gel molds around those, those areas and you end up with these nice empty little wells. Now, in addition to loading your DNA samples or your plasmid mini prep samples into the wells, you also always, 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 always need to load a marker or a ladder anytime you do a gel. If you run gel electrophoresis without a marker or ladder, which in the picture you can see it's this lane here. If you run a gel without the marker or ladder, your gel is considered useless and it's not considered accurate and you can't properly analyze it. Now, the point of having the marker, it's called a standard or a ladder. The point of that is to estimate the size of your samples to the distance traveled because a marker or a ladder, what it is, is a mixture of DNA fragments of known sizes. 
So for instance, if you're using the marker that we have in the figure here, every gel you run it on, you will have the same bands that you see here. So that's two, four, six bands. You will have those same six bands. And on any gel, the first band that you see closest to the well will represent a certain size, let's say 1.5 kb or 10 kb. And then the all of the other ones will represent given amounts, given sizes. And that helps you see on that particular gel where, you know, if a, if a DNA band is located at a certain point, it'll let you compare it to the ladder and know what size approximately your band is. So for instance, on this picture, you have all of the bands over here. You can approximate their size by just looking, okay, this band is close to the second band of the ladder. So you would know, okay, if my ladder, if that second band there is eight kilobases, that tells me that my DNA sample is around eight kilobases. Okay, so the ladder is very important. Now, when you run a gel, how exactly, you know, is this DNA moving through the gel? What's causing its navigation? Well, we already said you have an electric current running through. Okay, now if we were to draw a gel, I know I have the ones over on the side, but I will do my horrible drawing that comes out all slanted and weird because, you know, you're drawing on a upright screen. It's not as easy as drawing on a chalkboard. So anyway, you have your gel, you have your rectangles, they look more like squares, again, pardon my drawing. Uh, you have your rectangular wells, so I'll point out those are the wells, okay. When you set up your gel, you notice that in the pictures that I gave you earlier, you have it with a power source attached to it. So there's an electrode on each end. You can see that in this picture here, you have an electrode there and you have one here. So the cathode is the negative one, you have the anode on the positive side. Okay, that means that you are running that electrical current with a negative charge on one side and a positive charge on the other. Now, the way it should always be is you always you want your negative electrode near the wells and you want to place your positive electrode furthest away from your wells. This is very important because I've seen students and faculty members and you know, very well-established researchers ruin their gels by placing the electrodes on the wrong sides of the gel. The reason you want it this way, what's causing the navigation through the, through the gel is when you load your DNA into the wells. Okay, so you have your DNA over there. If you have a negative on one side, a positive on the other, what's the charge of DNA? Well, we said DNA is negatively charged. What do you know about two negatives? If you have negative DNA over here near a negative charge right here, what's it gonna wanna do? It will want to repel away from the negative and go toward the positive, okay? It will want to navigate away from the negative cathode and go toward the positive anode, okay? This is because opposites attract. Now, if you loaded your gel, so you have your gel here, you have your wells of DNA that are negative. If you loaded it with the cathode on the opposite side, so the, the negative electrode far away from the wells, the positive near the wells, what's gonna happen when you put a current through this, this gel? Well, the negative will be attracted to the positive charge it will run off the gel. So at the very end, you'll wait hours and hours, look to analyze your gel, and boom, you notice there's no DNA because it ran off the gel. So never, ever do that. Always make a star circle, highlight the fact that you always load DNA near the negative electrode, okay? The wells should always be near the negative electrode. And what causes the navigation through the gel is that electrical current. So the negative DNA wanting to go toward the positive charge, okay? The positive pole. Now, 
the way that it ends up moving through this agarose gel is, like I said, the gel has a bunch of small pores in it. And so the DNA will move by snaking its way through the pores of the gel. So what will happen with smaller fragments is they can move faster and further through those little pores, right? Whereas the larger fragments, what happens to them? They get stuck pretty quickly. It's kind of like if you look at a playground and you see that jungle gym on the playground and you see the little kids can run through that like little balls of lightning, right? They can run through, they can navigate, they can fit through every slide, every little curve, every little part because they're little. So they can fit through those holes. Whereas if one of the parents, one of the grown-ups, tries to chase after their kid playing with them, what happens? They'll get stuck. They'll get stuck in that tube or that, that slide because they're too big. So they can make a little bit of movement, but they'll quickly get stuck. So that's what happens with the DNA moving through the, the agarose gel. The large fragments will not get very far, okay? Now think about their starting point. Where are they starting? They're starting from the wells, okay? So I'm going to change color so that you, you don't miss this. The wells will be where the largest fragments, anything close to the wells will be the largest DNA fragments, and anything furthest from the wells will be the smallest DNA fragments because the small ones can zigzag through every little pore very quickly and make it very far. So always go based on the wells, the largest DNA closest to the wells and smallest DNA furthest from the wells. Now, the last point I want to make with running this gel is that in addition to having your agarose gel and your salt buffer, you will always use some sort of detection in the gel or the buffer, and usually they use ethidium bromide. Okay, so I'm going to get my marker. Sorry, pen. Uh, usually they use ethidium bromide as a detection agent. And so what they do is, depending on the lab you work in, they'll either put it in the gel itself when they are pouring that gel, or they'll put it in the buffer. Some labs prefer to put it in the gel, that way it's contained in a solid rather than the liquid because there are concerns about whether or not it's a mutagen and can cause cancer. It is also considered toxic a lot of times. So it's good to put it in your gel rather than the buffer itself. Now, the reason why ethidium bromide is so important is because it has two special characteristics. First of all, it is called an intercalating agent. Fancy term alert and pressure friends, intercalating agent means that ethidium bromide will basically bind to DNA and it will insert itself between the base pairs of DNA. Okay, that's important. Okay, so it inserts itself between the base pairs. And the second valuable characteristic is that it fluoresces in UV. Okay, this is important because when you think of running a gel, if this ethidium bromide starts out all over the gel, so picture it everywhere, I'm gonna just zigzag, that's, that's ethidium bromide everywhere in that gel. If it's an intercalating agent, then while you're running that gel, what will it do? It will find your DNA that you put in the wells that's running across the gel. So the ethidium bromide will now stick only to the DNA. That's why you get all of these individual bands because 
the ethidium bromide has now stuck and inserted itself only where the DNA is on that gel. The other valuable aspect is that it fluoresces in UV. So now all you have to do is take that gel, which currently looks blank to you, and shine UV light on it or put it on what's called a UV light. Sometimes they call it a UV light box. And now anywhere that the ethidium bromide is will fluoresce in UV. And where is the ethidium bromide? Where the DNA is, okay? So those are two very valuable aspects of the ethidium bromide. One last point I wanna make, let me grab the pen. Uh, one last point is whenever you are loading your samples, before you can load DNA in, you have to combine your sample with what's called loading dye. There are two very important aspects of loading dye, and I want you to circle, star, highlight loading dye, because a lot of people underestimate the value of loading dye, and then they have trouble troubleshooting when something goes wrong with their gel. Loading dye is very important because it has two aspects. One, it contains what's called bromo, bromophenol blue. Okay, so it is a, it's a bro, it's a good thing. Okay, so bromophenol blue, and sorry, I spelled that wrong. I was emphasizing bro, so it's actually spelled bromophenol blue. Okay, bromophenol blue. The purpose of that is a dye, like it says loading dye. It's a stain that's blue in color and it helps you visualize your sample because as you you know saw in the mini prep pictures, your DNA sample is currently clear. It looks like water. Good luck trying to load that into a well when you can't see where it's going. So instead it will stain it. It'll give it a color so you can see where you're loading very important first quality of loading dye. So make sure you understand why you use the bromophenol blue aspect and understand why it also has to have glycerol, okay? So the first part of that loading dye, which again, it contains both of these things, even though I'm numbering them, you don't add them separately. The loading dye itself contains both of these things. The first one is to give color to your sample so you can see where you're loading it. The second one weighs down the sample. Critical so that it stays in the well. Okay, this is important because when you are cleaning up that DNA, you use ethanol. A lot of the protocols use ethanol to clean the DNA. Ethanol will make DNA samples or any sample float out of a well. So as you try to pipette the sample into the well, the sample wants to float back out and go all over into the buffer and be lost forever. Glycerol prevents that. It weighs down the sample to keep it in the well so that you can keep it in the gel. This is critical to, to remember and circle star highlight because so many times I will see someone try to load a DNA sample they see that it's floating right back out of the well and they're losing the DNA. What do they do? They keep loading it. They keep pipetting it in. They lose their whole sample because it floats out and it floats away. When I have ever worked with a gel, because I know what, I'm, you know what the purpose of each reagent is, when I saw that a sample was starting to float out as soon as I pipetted in, what did I then do? I stopped pipetting. I kept the rest of the sample in my pipette tip. I put it back into its tube. And what did I do? I added more loading dye because that gave it more glycerol. So then I could then pipette it into a different well and you will see it then stays in. So I prevented myself from losing valuable DNA that you would then have to redo the whole experiment from the beginning if you lose that sample. So please always remember the point of loading dye is not just to give color, 
it also weighs down your sample. And if I give you a question where I say, what would you do if as you started pipetting a DNA sample into an agarose gel, it started to float out, I could ask you, what would you do? Add more loading dye, okay? Do not continue pipetting. Take the rest of the sample, put it in another tube, add more loading dye, and then load into the well, okay? So make sure you're clear on that. That comes back as a question a lot of times. And again, make sure you know loading dye contains bromophenol blue and glycerol in that one dye, and both have a very important function. So now we get into the results, okay, just so that you get a visual of everything, you know, in the lab in terms of what you would actually see. What I want to point out is that when you do this experiment and you do your gel electrophoresis, the pictures you see here are actual mini prep results from a plasmid called PRS-406. And you'll notice a few different things. First of all, I want to bring your attention to the fact that when you do the experiment, and you analyze your results, the one that I just circled, this gel on the left, is how it actually looks to you, okay? So when you take the gel and you place it on a UV box, this is how it looks on the left. You see a dark gel, and then you see the glowing bands wherever DNA is. So every bit of glowing that you see, whether they're the little bands or the big smears, that's all DNA, okay? What we then do in terms of publications and presentations is we take that picture and we reverse contrast it to give us the image that you see on the right here because that looks cleaner and better for us to analyze. Notice, for instance, you're able to see the individual bands of the marker much clearer. I wanna point out that in the picture, all of these bands are plasmid DNA. Whereas what are these two lanes? These are the markers, also called standards, also called ladder. So anytime you see any of those three terms, those are the samples that you loaded of known DNA sizes. So notice that there are two different ones. A lot of times we do that to maximize your ability to analyze your sample. You know, the plasmid ended up being large, around 5.8 kb, but if you ever have smaller bands that pop up, you want to use the smaller ladders with smaller, frag uh, you know, smaller size fragments that go further on the gel so that you can analyze DNA no matter where it falls on the gel. So for instance, the one on the left, the marker on the left, I wrote out what the bands represent. So if, for instance, you see a DNA band over here, what size would it be? You look at your marker, you notice that the furthest band, very faint on here, but the furthest band from the well in the 10 kb marker is 0 0.5 kb. So if I had a band of DNA right here, that would tell me that it's approximately 0.5 kb in size, okay? Whereas the ones higher up, you notice the bigger sizes, such as 10 kb, are closer to the wells. The wells are up here. Okay, so all of these, these are the wells where you loaded, the wells where you loaded the sample. Okay, and again, if you were looking at this the way you ran the gel, the negative would be over here, the positive would be over here, the smaller fragments came closer to this side, would come closer to this side, the larger fragments would be up here. Okay. So that is how you analyze the gels. Now, I want to point out a few things when you look at results of samples. When you run your plasmid DNA on a gel, okay, again, making sure you know how to read the gels, you have the wells over here, you have your marker to give you the approximate size of uh, any bands that you see. Um, when you run these gels and you look at plasmid DNA, what do you notice? The markers are nice, 
clearly defined single band, single fragments of DNA. But when you look at your plasmid, what do you notice? There's a whole lot of different bands you're seeing. So each of these wells, all that was loaded in each one is an individual plasmid DNA sample. So that should just be one plasmid, one size, right? But you see it as up to three individual bands from that single plasmid. The reason that is, the reason that is, the one that travels the furthest same plasmid, but even though it's all the same plasmid, there are different versions of that DNA in the one sample, okay? What you end up with is nicked bands, linear and supercoiled, all of the same plasmid. So whenever you see more than one band of plasmid DNA, it's because some of the plasmid has become nicked, some has linearized, and some is still in the supercoiled form. Now think about, visual, think about it visually and conceptually. If DNA is supercoiled, that means it's ultra, it's, it's, it's super coiled, it's ultra compact, it's like a little flower, very, very small, compact. So it's able to navigate through those pores easier, fit through, and make its way furthest. If it's linear, okay, if it's linear, picture it trying to get through the little pores. It's going to get stuck as it's trying to move forward, right, because you have the little pores. So it won't be able to travel as far. Then you have nicked. What nicked means is that plasmid DNA is usually two strands of DNA because DNA is double-stranded and they're in a circular form. But if it's been nicked, it means that one of the strands has been cut and it starts to unravel. So in nicked form of plasmid, you have the, the round inner strand and then you have the outer strands starting to unravel. That makes it even more problematic than the linear because it's got the roundness and the unraveling, unpredictable strands coming off of it that easily get stuck. Okay, so it's all the same plasmid, but throughout the process, such as um, mini prep itself, it may have been cut into nicked or linear form, some pieces of that plasmid DNA. Because remember, you don't have just one plasmid in the sample. You had a lot of bacteria that made a lot of copies of that plasmid, okay? And some of it got nicked or made linear by nucleases that were present, okay? So please remember, supercoiled plasmid is the bands that you will see the you know furthest away from the well for the plasmid DNA. Then comes linear, and then comes the, the nicks that didn't get to travel very far at all. I also want to just briefly point out to you what can be done in terms of gel electrophoresis. And I call this slide my, you know, that's, a, that, that's my weird flex bro. Uh, slide because these these are actually all these images that you're seeing are ones that I did in terms of uh, back in the day when I was working on uh, one of my thesis projects. And so what you see here is the initial gel in terms of plasma DNA that I had cut into two different fragments. So I wanted to cut a particular gene out of each of these plasmids so you see the main plasmid DNA, and then you see the gene that I cut out of each one. What you can then do with gel electrophoresis is I took this gel, again, it's like having a jello mold, and I took a razor blade and cut just directly around the bands that I wanted. So I wanted the big fragment from one plasmid, so I cut very close to that dark band, and I wanted the little gene from the other plasmid, so I cut the gel. I physically took a razor blade and cut out that DNA band from the gel. I then use a technique or a kit that helps you then break down that piece of gel and extract the DNA from that small piece. 
To make sure you successfully did that, you then run your samples again on a second gel after what's called gel extraction. Okay, so this was gel extraction. And so what this shows, you'll notice, what's this? It's just this. I got rid of having the extra DNA pieces that I didn't want. I got these specific pieces of DNA I wanted, cleaned them up, and now they're all by themselves for me to then work with that sample. Okay, so what we're able to do is gel extraction, and why would we want it? it why would we want to do this? Is because we could then pick and choose which pieces of DNA we clean up and work with. Okay, so it's a very valuable technique, and I'm just saying those are some beautiful bands I'm seeing. Must have been a very good scientist who did that. Just saying. The last pieces of troubleshooting and research um, results analyses that I want to show you is sometimes a student or even a researcher who's you know, been in the field for a while, will run a gel and they'll notice some things that they're unsure of. One thing that you commonly see are these big smears that are just at the bottom of the gel. Notice that you don't see them anywhere else on the gel. You see the regular DNA bands and then you see these big smears at the bottom. If you ever see big smears just at the bottom of the gel, that means that your sample had RNA contamination okay and sorry I was running out of screen so I scribbled that last part <laughs> but that says RNA contamination what's another way that you can confirm that do the UV spec and if you did the UV spec the 260 280 ratio that you would get for this kind of a sample would be above 1.8 so maybe you'd see 1.9 or 2.0 if it was pure RNA and nothing else. So this would probably give you around 1.9 reading. If instead of just seeing the big smears at the bottom of the lane, if you see the big smears the whole way through, notice you don't have any nice clean bands, except for a few of the samples you can kind of see the band peeking through, okay? But you have all of this smear all along, very long smear. What that tells you is the DNA got degraded. Okay, meaning most likely you did not get rid of all the nucleases, you didn't use enough protease maybe, and so the DNA that you were trying to isolate and clean up got chopped the bits, denatured and unfolded and then chopped up, it got destroyed. So this would not be a good usable sample. Instead, you would have to redo the experiment. And one of the things I would recommend is make sure that you don't skip the protease, maybe even add more protease than you were doing to better protect the DNA from nucleases. And keep in mind, you can also, after you've isolated the plasmid, you can accidentally give it nucleases by, let's say, not wearing gloves when you handle the DNA or putting a pipette tip into that sample that was, you know, not sterile. So be careful about things like that. Make sure to keep your DNA not degraded. Okay, that is it for today. You know, all very valuable techniques, valuable analysis, uh, things to think about. You know, when it comes to sciences, yes, it's important to get the hands-on experience, but, you know, it's kind of easy to say, okay, put this liquid here, put this, you know, sample here, but following a protocol isn't everything, and what you saw in this lesson is much more valuable in the long run than the hands-on experience because so many times I could see people who can follow a protocol, but when things go wrong or when they finally get the results at the end, they have no idea what it means. They have no idea how to then fix things or get better results to really you know, finish their project or get publications. So please keep these things in mind since any part of science that you go into tends to, at one point or another, require you to do gel electrophoresis.
Okay, as always, contact me with any questions in the Remind app and make sure that you send me that Remind question that I asked earlier in today's lesson. Thank you and have a great day.